Welcome to another live live stream. Um, I'm excited. I'm back from Miami. I know some of you follow me on social media. I've been doing a bunch of posts about my experience in Miami, heading out to the Rays Masters annual retreat. Uh, Rays Masters, um, you know, where I went in Miami, the conference, Rays Masters, it's all about teaching people how to raise money for their real estate investing deals. And today, I'm going to talk about my biggest takeaways from the event. And, and there were a lot, and there were a lot. And, and what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to um, treat it like I'm going to give you all of the information all of the nuggets, everything that I learned at the event, I'm going to convince, condense three days worth of information into about an hour. And that's definitely going to be challenging because there were a ton of takeaways. It was a very worthwhile trip for me. And I'm going to start out by just telling you how, how the trip started. So um, guys, um, I grew up in greater Boston. and I lived in Revere, Massachusetts, which is a city that is one town over from where the, where the airport is. The airport in Boston is in East Boston, which is, again, it's literally one town over from where I grew up. And I had a nine o'clock flight. And for some reason, I thought that because the GPS told me that if I left my house at 7.30, AM that I would get there by eight, I thought that I would have enough time. And unfortunately, again, I referenced the fact that I grew up one town over from where the airport is located. Unfortunately, that experience growing up, knowing about how Boston traffic is in the morning, did not help me whatsoever. I did not plan and I missed my freaking flight. I missed my flight. And as I was sitting there in the cab, and I kept getting calls. I was in an Uber and I kept getting calls from Uber and they were literally calling me and saying, hey, is everything OK? Because you're really not moving. And I'm not going to lie that that didn't really make me feel any better to, to basically get a call from Uber basically saying, hey, by the way, we know you're not moving either. So as I sat there in bumper to bumper traffic, which I should have anticipated because it was literally the exact time where people bring their kids to school in the morning on the way to Boston. I should have anticipated that. But as I'm sitting there, I'm thinking in my head, this is going to make for a nice intro to the next live stream that I do, which is that I could have at that moment just said, you know what, this is too much of a hassle, you know, turn the Uber around and, you know, let's just, you know, skip the trip. Because frankly, yeah, just being completely transparent with you. I don't love traveling. I don't love sitting in airports. I hate sitting on planes. I hate sitting on planes. I'm not that big of a guy, but I still am big enough that it's never comfortable unless I'm sitting, you know, in a row by myself, which I did get on the way home. But I hate traveling. Um, I I have a very, you know, I have a very um, repeatable daily routine, and it just completely throws me off. It throws off my eating. It throws off my sleeping. It throws off everything. But as I sat there in that Uber, you know, the the realization came into my head that I'm I'm dedicated. I know that I'm going to get value out of going to this conference, and I'm going to not only pay, you know, to get another um, flight. But I'm going to spend the time. I'm going to waste the time. I'm going to sit. In, I'm going to sit in the airport for the extra few hours, and sit there. And I'm going to do some work on my laptop. But I'm going to suffer through because I know that going to this event is worthwhile. And I mention this in part just to say to some of the people, especially the people that are local, that are in New England, that have said to me at any point over the last couple of months, "Hey, I live in Hartford, Connecticut. Hey, I live in Providence, Rhode Island. Hey." I live in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. Going to your event in Danvers, Massachusetts is too far. Guys, you have got to commit to learning. I promise you, if you haven't signed up for the event already at www.agentinvestorevent.com, 
I guarantee you're going to get value out of it. I guarantee you're going to leave that two-day event um, feeling the way that I left after this this few-day uh, race master's retreat in Miami. It was absolutely worth it. Was it convenient? Were there times where I was like, I wish I wasn't on this flight? Was there a time when I was sitting in that Uber that I thought for a moment, hey, maybe I should just turn this around and not go? Absolutely. But again, now that I'm on the other side of it, I know that there were things that happened at this event that were life-changing for me. And there was. Okay. And this is coming from somebody. I've been in a ton, ton of coaching programs. I've been to many events, but I still get the value out of going to these events. So in terms of takeaways, I do want to jump into this. Um, there were a few big, big, big takeaways. You know, when I talk to real estate agents, and really it doesn't even just apply to real estate agents, but when I talk to real estate agents, the number one reason why everybody tells me that they haven't started investing yet, what do you guys think, actually? Tap into the chat box. What do you think the number one reason that I get from real estate agents as to why they have not invested in real estate yet? Tap into the chat box. I want to see what you guys have and what you would guess that I get told on a weekly or if not daily basis. All right, we got a couple of responses already coming in. Capital, capital. Capital, money. That's what everybody tells me. I don't have the money, so I can't get started. I don't have the money, so I'm going to do nothing. And here's my here's the thing that I want to put in all your brains right now, because this actually blew me away. I'm going to be completely honest. This blew me away at the event in Miami. I was sitting there. There's about 125 people that were in the group. and Almost none of the people were in real estate. Like they didn't start in real estate. And almost every single person at the event, at the event, had only been in this Raise Masters coaching program for less than a year. You know, some of them have been in for a year and a half, two years, some of them a year. But a lot of them, you know, I, I talked to as many people as I could. And most of them that I talked to, Hey, I've been in Raise Masters for six months. I've been in for three months. I've been in for nine months. And you would be shocked at how much money these people have raised. And again, not everybody had success raising capital. You know, there was someone there that, that celebrated their first million dollars of raising capital. And that's awesome. But there were a lot of people there that have been only raising capital for nine, 10, 11, 12 months that have raised $4 million. $10 million. There was somebody there that raised $20 million. And I'm sitting there, frankly, I'm feeling like a chump because I'm sitting there saying, my 2023 goal is to raise $20 million. I've been doing this thing for 15 years. I've been raising capital all along the way. And now I'm second guessing, hey, maybe 20 million shouldn't be my goal. But, but 20 million is my 2023 goal. But as I'm sitting in that room, and as I have all of you, all of your attention right now, I just want to say that the people that I talk to, they are not as far ahead a year ago as you are today. You're already in real estate, right? You can talk the talk, walk the walk. You've taken listings. You've worked with buyers. You understand investing at least at a base level. Some of you understand investing very, very well. And so... If these people who are who came from the tech business or who came from a, you know an entrepreneurial space or wherever their background was that wasn't real estate can raise two, three, four, five, ten million dollars in their first year trying, then anybody on this call can. Um, and I'm going to talk about you know more importantly like what they what they talked about at the conference. but these again, most of these people that were at this conference, most of these 100, 125 people, they didn't have this big sphere of influence. They didn't have the training that you all had as agents to say, hey, build a database, feed your database, talk to your database. Most of these people have never been in sales before. But again, they committed. They joined this Raise Masters group. They paid, um, well, I paid $10,000 to get into that group. Now it's 15000 they committed, they paid the money, they paid their dues, and they started raising. So my question to anybody out there that says they don't have the money to do a real estate deal, what would having one or two or three million dollars today, you know, 
help you achieve. Because again, if you looked around that room, and this is this is the one of the big things about attending stuff in person. I, you know, after doing this for so long, I anticipated looking around a room of people being in real estate for 20 years, all super impressive, like, you know, can't touch them type of people. And again, what I found was, wow, this guy raised six million dollars. He's he's a uh, you know, he's a tech person. He didn't even quit his job yet. And he raised six million dollars this year. So huge, huge takeaway. Um, so the results they got were crazy. But let me talk about the takeaways, right? Because, you know, they, they did a lot of individual presentations from the leaders in the group and the owner of the group, but they also did panels. So a couple of things that I want to talk to you guys about in terms of, you know, what I got out of those panels. So one of the first people that they interviewed, a guy named Nick, he's an entrepreneur. He started and sold a couple of businesses, and he specifically raises capital by niching down and talking specifically to entrepreneurs. I, the biggest thing with, with the capital raising, the biggest takeaway I got, besides the fact that there are a bunch of people out there raising a lot of money that didn't have any experience doing it just a year ago. But the second thing that I got that I kind of already knew, but you know, I'm going to say it again, you have to niche down. In order to raise capital, you have to get an audience, right? My audience are agents that want to invest in real estate or help their clients invest in real estate. That's my capital raising niche. That's my coaching niche. That's my niche. You guys are my people. You're agents that either invest in real estate, you want to invest in real estate, or you work with clients who invest in real estate. But this particular person, Nick, um, his niche was working with entrepreneurs. Why? Because he was an entrepreneur himself. So one thing that they kept hitting us over the head with again is like the people that you want to raise money from are people that are just like yourself because you connect with those people. You know what those people are thinking. Like I know what all you agents are thinking. You don't have to tell me what you're thinking. I know. I know every objection you're going to give me. I know how to overcome it. I know your struggles. I know your pain points. I know what you need. Even if you don't know what you need, I know what you need. Because I've been around the industry for so long. And this guy, Nick, he knows what entrepreneurs need. So he had a really specific niche. Now, I'm going to ask you guys all another question that I'm just curious. If you're out there raising capital, what do you think the rate of return that you need to give people for them to be excited about giving you capital is? What do you guys think? I'm going to repeat the question. Please type the answer into the chat box. What do you think you need to be out there pitching like, hey, I'm going to give you this rate of return. Take your money out of the stock market. Take the money out of your IRA. Take the money out of your bank account. Invest it with me. And I'm going to give you X percentage return. What do you think that X needs to be? Please type it into the chat box because I'm just curious to see what you guys have to say about what the rate of return needs to be. I'm going to pause for a second. Give me your rate of return that you think that you need to be offering in order to be successful as a capital raiser and fund your real estate deals. Come on, guys. Help me out here. Let me see. All right. I see a couple coming in. All right. Somebody said at least 8%. Anybody else have a comment? Help me out. Type it in. What do you think the percent needs to be? If you're out there talking to people, somebody said 15 to 20. 9%, Joe said. Some of your names I can see for some reason, and some of them I can't. But... um. Joe said nine. So this guy, Nick, um, it kind of, again, another surprise to me. He said he offers 8%. And I thought, wow, 8%. I, I offer on all of my investments 12 to 20. How's he doing eight? How's he doing eight? And then he explained it. He said, I have a product. <clears throat> Specific for entrepreneurs that have money in the bank, that I get them 8% annualized, but I get them their money back in 90 days. And he said, the reason that's important for an entrepreneur, and this spoke to me, is that entrepreneurs, they, they usually, if you're a good entrepreneur, you've got money sitting on the sideline in, in case of a rainy day, in case of something bad happening. You're always worried about something bad happening. 
a sale not going through, the market correcting, whatever. So as an entrepreneur, if you've got money on the sideline, like you you want to get a 15 to 20% rate of return, but you don't want to lock up your money because you don't know what's going to happen. You got payroll, you have everything, right? You have payroll, you have sales, you have to float your own, you know, expenses. And he said, he goes, I have a niche. My entrepreneurial niche, they don't want a long-term commitment. They want to be in real estate. They want to passively invest, but they don't want a long-term commitment because they're afraid. What if I can't make payroll? What if this? What if that? So the entrepreneurs that he deals with, they only want a 90-day commitment. And I was like, wow. And I actually started thinking in my head, I'm like, I've got, I've got money on the sideline that's, that's operational money that I'm like, I know I don't need it back within 90 days, but I also know I don't want to lock it up for two years. And so the biggest thing that he talked about, and this is like with capital raising, you have to pick a niche, but you have to understand the needs of that niche. Because if if he was up there and all he said was, I offer an 8% rate of return, I would have said, wow, that's about the lowest I've ever heard. But then after he explained it, I was like, oh, not only do I understand this, but I might even be a candidate for this product, even though I use money in my own deals. But my deal is I'm locking up money for a year, two years, three years. So I'm like, damn, this makes sense. That's his niche, right? So who's your niche if you're raising capital? Who's like you that you can relate to, that you can get an audience with, that will listen to you because you understand them, that has a problem, that has capital that's not yet deployed, okay? Second person came from a tech sales background. Okay, another person specializes in people in certain levels of tech sales. Again, he has a tech sales background. He uses LinkedIn. And how he uses LinkedIn, LinkedIn allows you to basically segment by people's titles. So he knows, and again, like I remember this from being in the accounting world. If you kind of told me someone's title in a public accounting profession, I would know about how much they make. And I would know kind of what stage they're at in their life, probably how old they are, um, probably whether or not they would consider putting money into a deal. And so he said he uses LinkedIn. And he knows that people that are in tech sales, his niche, and I'm going to screw up the age and I'm going to screw up this stuff because this is not my niche. But he knew that it was like 33 to 38 year olds that were, you know, low level vice presidents in tech sales. They typically make a base of about six figures. They make a base of like 100, 125, 150, but then they have a lot of upside on bonuses. And what he said is typical is these people, they live off of that 100, 125, 150, but they work for that bonus. And that bonus, he said, can a lot of times be $100,000, $150,000, $175,000. And they get that bonus all at once. So it's like a year end, here's a check for $100,000. And what he said was almost all of those people, a lot of them aren't thinking investing. A lot of them are thinking, oh, I'll put a pool in this year. I'll do this. I'll do that. And his entire conversation is based around the fact that if you invest, $50,000 a year in my fund moving forward, these are what the results are going to be. So I know you just got a check for 150. Just don't spend all 150. Give me 50. Give me 50 and these are what the results are going to be. And that's his niche. And again, he knows how to talk to those people. He understands their lives. He understands their jobs. He understands the negative of that job and what he's kind of selling against, right? Because again, when I'm talking to a group of agents like I'm talking to right now, I know all your pain points, right? I know the fact that a lot of you are living on the real estate roller coaster, right? You're you're getting paid, you're being you're rich, then two months later you're broke, then you're rich again. How do I know this? Because that was me. Right. I was on the real estate roller coaster until I started investing. 
So I know that niche and I know what the problem is. And I know that for everybody who's listening right now, who's an agent, if you had four, five, six thousand dollars a month coming in and passive income, that would change your life. Why would it change your life? Well, it would allow you to not have to worry constantly about your next deal. It would allow you to fire that jerky client that you know you should fire. It would allow you to not take that $150,000 condo buyer that you know you shouldn't be taking, but you take anyways because you're like, "Uh, I don't know when my next deal's coming in. So I know the pain points. So my question to all of you is what's your niche? If you're trying to raise capital, what's your niche? How can you talk to them? And how can you solve their problem? Right? Raising capital isn't about going out and begging for money. It's not about going out there and saying, hey, like, you know, I I don't even know who you are or what you're doing, but hey, invest with me and your life will be better. It's about understanding the niche, serving the niche, right? And and through real estate investing, you can do that. Right. There, there's not a lot of other vehicles out there where you can say, hey, you know, somebody said uh, at the 20 minute mark, somebody typed into the chat box at least 8 percent. I mean, that's a great rate of return, even just 8 percent. Right. Because what are most people getting? Well, if it's in a bank, they're getting zero. If it's in the stock market, they're shaking in their boots. Right. So where else can they put their money in an asset they understand, right? Everybody understands real estate in their backyard, right? Because you're probably going to buy properties in their backyard that they can see, feel, and touch. So you're serving these people, okay? Another thing that I'm going to talk about, and this relates to agents very specifically, and this is a mistake we all make, and as they were talking about this mistake, It kind of punched me in the mouth because I do this all the time, which is that I train on details and I don't talk enough about the personal side of my life and I don't tell my story as much as I should. Now, I know this. I've heard this. I've heard this over and over again. This is like marketing 101, right? And, and, and it specifically relates to all of you as real estate agents, right? And, and you see this. And I'm going to say something that's probably a little controversial, but you guys don't listen to me because I'm going to be politically correct. I'm going to be honest. Honesty sometimes hurts. I got hurt when I was at this conference when I heard, when I heard this. But nobody wants to see a reposted piece of content about the market, right? There's all of these programs, there's all of these email marketing programs, all of these social media programs like Keeping Current Matters and all of this stuff, right? And when you when you sign up for these, you go, whoa, this is solving my problem. And I, I'm, I'm talking to myself and you right now, I'm talking to both of us. Because we see like a Keeping Current Matters or we see like a Home Actions and they're like, oh, well, they'll they'll create your social media content for you. Boom. Like that takes away all the stress. I don't need to worry about creating any social media content anymore. I'll just repost something that says that don't, you know, this, this is one you've probably seen all the time. So, you know, marry the house, don't date the rate. Right? Who here has heard that? Tap into the comment section if you've seen an infographic lately that's like, marry the house, don't date the rape. Do me a favor, tap into the chat section section if you've seen that, right? And when you see it, you're like, oh, that's kind of like smart. Like that's a cool little saying. And um it's been reposted by pretty much everybody in real estate that ever existed. But then you go, wait a second. Did anybody see that? Because when you're out there and you're posting on social media or you're sending a message to your email, you know, email list, the purpose is not to post or to send an email. That is not the purpose, right? We in our heads, because 
it's easy. We say, oh, did you send, did you post today? Yeah, I posted today. I posted, marry the house, don't date the rate. I sent an email, marry the house, don't date the rate. I sent an email. All right, have you done your, your fall cleanup lately? But the purpose isn't sending an email. The purpose isn't posting, right? That, that's not what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to get an audience that buys into us and into what we're doing. And frankly, nobody wants to get that email about their fall cleanup. Like it's a completely garbage email. It's a completely garbage post. Nobody wants to see it. The cool thing about social media, social media will actually tell us whether or not our content is successful. Now, if you guys look at my social media, I'm talking to me as much as I'm talking to you because I make this mistake too. But I did a post, and I didn't think this post was actually going to gain any traction. But I did a post. You guys should check it out on the Tommy Caffarella Facebook page. I did a post about me, and I was sitting in the airplane on the flight to Miami, and I took a selfie, and I just talked briefly about like what I was doing. 210 likes. Now, for me, that's a lot, okay, because most of the stuff I post, I get 20, 30, 40. And again, it's a lesson. What's the lesson? People go on social media or they read their emails. What do they want? If they're connected to me, they want me. And that's, that's actually hard for me to even grasp. It's hard for me to grasp because I'm just, you know, average Joe. I'm shy. I don't like doing a selfie. I would much rather put up that, you know, marry the house, don't date the rate. But the proof is in the pudding. And what they talked about a lot was that people buy into personalities. And this is related to raising capital, but it's also related to everything that we do in sales. And people buy into the personalities, right? And what they said, they were talking about Grant Cardone. Now, Grant Cardone, I, I mean, listen, um, I don't know what you guys think about him. You know, I don't know. I, I'm not even sure what the world thinks about him. But when I hear him talk, I'm not thinking he's the smartest guy in the world at all, at all. In fact, he's not my favorite person, but yet I know who Grant Cardone is. And I know Grant Cardone's personality. If I met him, I've never met him. I probably never will meet him. But I think if Grant Cardone walked up to me today, I would feel like I already knew him. And I don't think I would, I would leave with any differing opinion about his personality. Why? Because he's out there. He's real. You know who Grant Cardone is. He puts himself out there. And again, this is me talking to myself. This is my takeaways. But I'm also talking to you because I know this is a, a truth for all of you as well. People like your personality and they want to get to know your personality more than they want to know, hey, marry the house, don't date the rate. They don't care about that, especially when they're on social media. Geez, they're not coming on for like a lot of education. So this is something <clears throat> that they were talking about. And you have to be an expert and you have to know what you're talking about and you have to provide value. But it is far more important to be what they call an attractive character, an attractive character, than it is to know what you're talking about. And that's hard for me because I'm a detail-oriented person. I think information is king. I love getting educated. I love training. But again, what's important? What's more important is that they remember your stories, that they remember you. And they made a very good point. And their point was, is that if all you give is information and that's all you give and they don't get to know your personality, they don't understand you. They don't understand. Like for me, I got four kids, I'm married, this, that, all the stuff about me. Then as soon as like my content information kind of runs dry, now they're on to the next person as opposed to somebody that they always stick with. Right. And again, this could be about anything. This is, this is marketing. This doesn't even have anything to do with raising capital, but it was about raising capital. 
So it was interesting. And then they talked about, like, I, I just mentioned in air quotations, the attractive character. Now, the attractive character does not mean like Superman. The attractive character actually means the real you. Because the real you, like not the social media you, and again, I have this problem myself. The social media you a lot of times is like this superhero that never makes mistakes, that's perfect, that's a genius, that um, you know, just never has anything bad to them, anything ever bad to bad happening to them. And they were talking, and when they were talking about the attractive character, they were actually meaning like kind of like the real origin story about who you are. And then they talked about in the room, some attractive characters. And one of them was, was a woman um, has raised a bunch of capital and her story was that she's college educated. She gets into the workforce. She's starting her career. She's doing really well. She gets married. She has four kids. Doesn't work for like 20 years. All of a sudden, she finds out that her husband is leaving her. She said there was no notice. They weren't fighting. There was nothing. And she realized at that moment that she needed, she hadn't worked in 20 years, but she needed to figure something out. And she needed to figure a way to make money that was going to allow her to not only support her kids financially, but also support them and take care of them at the same time. Meaning like, she didn't want to go back to a corporate job because she wasn't going to be able to spend the time with them. So she got into raising capital, funding bigger um, commercial real estate deals. But her story and who she speaks to is that divorced woman who's kind of had the, the rug pulled from under her. And that's her attractive character. By the way, there's a lot of those people out there. You know, same as my story, right? What's my story? My origin story is I grew up poor and didn't have a lot of guidance. I knew I should, I was told, do good in school, get a great job. Then I read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, changed my life. And, you know, you guys have probably heard my story. So what's your origin story? And that's a story that should be told. And what are your hobbies? And what do you like to do? And again, this is like the stuff that should be put in front of your SOI. Your SOI should know if you're thinking about investing in real estate and you haven't yet, should know like, hey, I'm starting to invest in real estate. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm plugged into. This is what I love today. Your SOI should know your hobbies. Your SOI should know, you know, failures you've had, struggles you've had, successes that you've had, right? And and yes, the post about marry the house, date the rate, it can be put in there, but like that should be like an add-on, extra. And the more personalized it can be, the more people are going to want to work with you. Hey, everyone. This is Tom Caffarella. I want to quickly interrupt the podcast to, number one, thank all of my loyal listeners of the Agent Investor Podcast and tell you guys really quickly about an exciting event we have coming up. Uh, It's a two-day event. It's called the Passive Income Real Estate Investor Event um, that you can find out more details at Passive Income event.com. We're going to be doing a two-day training session teaching all of the agents and all of the investors at the event on how to achieve financial freedom through real estate. If you're like me and your goal is to not work 80, 100 hours a week grinding, selling real estate, flipping homes, um, definitely check out this event. We're going to teach you how to build a passive income portfolio so that you can retire, so that you can work when you want, how you want, and ultimately achieve financial freedom. So again, go to PassiveIncomeEvent.com for more details. And we look forward to seeing you at the upcoming event. And this was, again, a conference all about raising capital, but it applies to sales relation. Raising capital is a relationship sale, and so is real estate sales. So it applies all across the board to any relationship sales, okay? So next topic, they talked about speed to action, speed to action. And they talked about how the most successful people 
and I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard this before, but they take action. And they take action fast. And what they talked about is, and this I know this is true, and I know that some of you are struggling with this right now because everybody struggles with this. You go, oh, I can't invest in real estate yet. I didn't start my Instagram channel or like I didn't buy this piece of software or I didn't have a CRM yet or you're not ready, right? And, and what they talked about and they studied and they're even talking about the people that are successful raising capital in the group. All of the people that were successful raising capital in their first year of raising capital all started. And one of the people that they interviewed that it raised, she was actually a real estate agent. She raised $5 million in her first year as a real estate agent. And she said that she didn't have a CRM. And she said, you don't need a CRM. She said, I had a list of past clients. I called through all those past clients to talk about the, talk about real estate investing. And this is like one of the biggest hacks I can give to all of you guys. If you go to like a Tom Ferry conference or like a Mike Ferry conference or name the real estate coach guru of retail sales, they're going to say, call through your sphere of influence. Just call and it doesn't really matter what you say. And hey, pick up the phone. Hey, today's... um. You know, Halloween's coming up. Like, hey, what are you kids dressing up as? And I've always taken issue with this. Always. Because I think that's a very contrived conversation. I think that if you haven't talked to somebody in four months, you call them up and you're like, hey, what's your kid being for Halloween? I think it's a bad relationship thing. I, I, I do. I don't really care, you know, what, another real estate guru says. And I'm not even saying that you can't be successful doing that. I just think most of us aren't going to do it because it feels contrived. Now, flip that around. And you call through those same people and you go, hey, you know, Bob, I sold your house three years ago. I wanted to see how it was going. I wanted to know if you had any interest in investing in real estate. There is almost nobody on this planet who doesn't have an interest in investing in real estate. How do you guys think, like I grew my Facebook group from zero people to 6,000 people in like a year. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. How did I grow it that fast? I just ask every real estate agent, send them a Facebook message, send an email. Hey, Mr. Real Estate Agent, are you interested in investing in real estate? Almost everybody says yes. Why? Because almost everybody in the planet is interested in investing in real estate. So while Bob would probably find it really odd, in my opinion, if you called him and asked him what his kids are being for Halloween, he would probably be pretty intrigued if you called and asked him if he was interested in investing in real estate. But you don't even need to call. You could run an event. You could say, hey, Bob, text message. Bob, I haven't reached out to you for a while. I apologize. I've been meaning to catch up with you. Um, I just started investing in real estate or I'm a real estate investor myself. And I'm running this event that teaches my past clients how to invest in real estate. Do you have any interest? You're going to get a lot of yes. You're going to get a lot of yes because a lot of people are interested in investing. Now, there's two directions you can go with that conversation, right? Direction one is help them find an asset to buy which by the way, you guys get paid on. Direction number two, they may just want to be completely passive. They may be like, yeah, I thought about investing in real estate, but I don't want to manage tenants or unclog toilets. Cool. That's potential capital for you to raise. Okay. Um, The next thing that they talked about, and they were selling an upgrade to the coaching program. So this is common in the coaching space. I'm in this program that costs... 10 G's, 10 grand, and they they talked about a 40K program. And um, they talked about finding a good coach. And again, I think this is relevant for the people that are on this call. I, I've talked a number of times. I didn't do my first real estate deal until six years later when I got a coach. His name was Aaron 
Katz. He'd probably punch me if I told you his name. He's still in the Boston market. He's probably five years older than me. I don't, actually, you know what? He's probably not even five years older than me. But he was the catalyst for me. And I remember jumping on a call with Aaron. This is after reading like every real estate investing book out there. And I jumped on a call with him. And I left that call. And I go, I know I'm going to do real estate deals now. I knew it. And the reason I knew it is because I was so darn confused reading book after book. One book would tell me to do this. One book would tell me to do that. I, I just kept leaving them with like not knowing what to do. And I remember jumping on that call with Aaron. And on that call with Aaron, I left the conversation going, I got every question that I asked answered and I knew that they were the right answers because he was confident. He had done what I wanted to do, et cetera. So these are the three things that Hunter Thompson, who is the coach in Raise Masters, said about choosing a coach. Okay. Number one thing you want to look for, he called it, is a close proximity to the ideal outcome. And what he meant by that is you want to find somebody who has done what you want to do. That sounds really simple, but I've seen a lot of people buy into coaching programs and their coach is somebody who hasn't even done what they want to do, or they've done something like parallel, but not exact. Okay. So he said, you want to find somebody with close proximity to the ideal outcome. Two, gut feel perspective. And I totally agree with this. Um, I have been in a lot of coaching programs. I've probably paid a half a million dollars to be in different programs in the course of a 15 year period. There were coaches that I paid that had a gut feeling that it wasn't going to be a good fit, but I saw that they had the results I wanted. And I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to do it. Cause I'm such a big advocate of paid coaching cause it's a shortcut. But I, I agree with this gut feeling perspective. Like if you don't think that you would enjoy working with the person, you don't get along with them. You think they're a jerk. You know, you don't want to work with them. Number three, this is another important one. Desire to be a coach, right? Somebody who's passionate about the subject matter. And I had this, um, I did have an experience with one coach. You guys should probably know his name if I said it, <clears throat> but he was the type of person who we had a call every other week. That was the way this coaching platform was set up. We had a call every other week. And in between calls, I would always have something to ask. And sometimes like a day after the call, I'd have something to ask. And, and multiple times I would reach out to him and either one of two things would happen. Uh, one would either be that he would ignore the email or number two, he would say, thanks for the email, save it for the call. Now, this is just like my personality, my perspective, my perspective. If somebody is asking you a question in between a call, it's because you're they're an implementer. They're actually doing it. Um, I've probably coached 200 people at this point. About, I'd actually have to really think about this, but probably about 200 people. Nobody who asks questions in between a lot of times is doing it because they're just wasting time. Those are the action takers that are like, I actually want to take action on this tomorrow and I just need a quick answer. And so number three, what Hunter said, desire to actually help, desire to be a coach. And this is like a 50-50 thing. Um, and, and, and I want to defend, I want to actually defend this person a little bit because I totally get it. Like um, a lot of times you run into a situation where like you want to like guard your time. And I, and I, I used to be like this. Um, I used to be like this a lot. And, and I, I found that it was actually not genuine to my own personality. I used to actually be like him where I would say, hey, wait the two weeks. But I realized that's not what I wanted to do. I was only doing it because I thought I had to. And now that I'm 40 now, sadly, now like I rely on my own intuition more than kind of what you know a book might tell me to do. So 
when I set up the inner circle coaching program, I set it up to be 24 seven, 365 access to me. And I set that up purposely because I know that for the action takers, when they need help, they need help. So, um, quick story about that. And I've got a couple more points I want to make, but I have somebody, Leo, who's probably on this call. He's in the inner circle. I love him. I make fun of him all the time. You know that I like you if I'm making fun of you, by the way. Um, I grew up in Revere, Mass. That's just what we did. If you if you were friends with somebody, you, you pretty much tortured them. Um, but, but if you didn't like them, then you just didn't even talk to them. So, Leo, if you're listening, I love you. But I was at a wedding the other day, and Leo reached out to me with a question. This was like Saturday at 5 o'clock. I walked out of the wedding to answer the question. Now, when I told Leo, like, hey, I'm at a wedding, just, you know, wanted to get back to you. He's like, dude, get back to the wedding. What I said to him, and I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that he fully even understands this yet. I go, Leo, I was just sitting in a circle of people that weren't talking about real estate. When somebody gives me an excuse to talk about real estate, I'm taking it. And it's probably not necessarily a great life skill. It's probably a bad life skill. Um, I'm lucky that my wife still loves me and that I'm not divorced and that she really doesn't give me too much crap about this, this personality thing, but I'm very passionate about real estate. Don't give me an excuse to talk about real estate because I will take it. So it's like a combination of two things. I'm not great socially. So if you say like, Hey, how's the weather? Um, let's have a normal uh, adult conversation. It's like, I don't even know how to have it. So then if you say, Hey, there's another person here that wants to talk about real estate. I'm like, okay, sorry. You know, weather person, I'm talking about real estate. Um, so if you guys feel that I might be the right person for you, and I may not be, I may be a horrible person for you. You may not like my persona. You may not think I know what I'm talking about. You might feel just not great about me in general, but what I would advocate is you guys sign up for a call at www.agentinvestorinnercircle.com. www.agentinvestorinnercircle.com. What I do on those calls, just so you know, is I treat them like a strategy session. And we address whatever problems you're having in the investing world. And yes, at the end, I will ask you if you want to join the inner circle. But on that call, you will basically get a free coaching session. Um, you know, I do this. I've got three ways to get into the inner circle. And all of them are, are motivated by me making money, bottom line. But it's a win-win. I get to talk to more people about real estate and I get to make money to help my family, to help my four kids. Um, so there's three ways to get in. Um, there's a flat $5,000 fee, number one. Or number two, you could join our brokerage. Or number three, you could invest fifty thousand dollars into an apartment deal that we have and make a fifteen to twenty percent rate of return. So, if you think that I could help you um, with your real estate investing goals, and you'd consider doing one of those three options, only one of them you need to do. Just go to www.agentinvestorinnercircle.com and schedule a call and. Um, and just so you guys know, I'm not a salesperson um, by nature. I'm a nerd by nature. So I'm. I'm. If if you if at the end of the call you're like I'm not interested, it's going to be the easiest sales call you've ever gotten off of in your life. Because what I've learned um, is that the people who are going to have success in coaching are those that know that they need it and are excited about doing it. So I will admit, and this is going to be, you know, I'll just, I tell you guys everything. I don't care. I have convinced people to be coached by me in the past, meaning like I've overcome their objections. I am doing everything I can and I convince them. But I've learned that those people are not the right people because they're not motivated enough. So if I have to convince you to work with me, then it's not good because you're not going to do the work and you're not going to be successful. And then you're going to get mad because you're going to be like, you convinced me to do this and I was going to get all these. No, like 
you got to do the work and you got to be excited about doing the work. So um, one last thing that was like a crazy takeaway and an interesting story. And I know it's true in life. <clears throat> Hunter, if you guys have ever heard of Harrow, help a reporter out. It's this guy. He started this thing where you can basically get into different publications or on the news or into like print by helping a reporter out. So what they'll do is they'll say like, Hey, I'm looking for a real estate agent. Think they can give me like some perspective on what they're, what they're facing in their local market. And again, like if you respond, then you're going to get picked up by that news outlet and they're going to interview you or ask you to write something or whatever. Harrow, H-A-R-O, help a reporter out. So this guy who um, who started that company, Harrow, I think his name is Peter Shankman. I guess <clears throat> he suffers from a severe case of ADHD. He has really a hard time focusing and paying attention. And he became semi-famous, or maybe he's just famous. Um, where he got asked by a publishing company to write a book. And the company, for whatever reason, basically told him, like, they need a manuscript, though, within two weeks. And Peter knows himself. And Peter knows that if you give him two weeks to do something, because of his ADHD, he's going to put it off, he's going to procrastinate, and he may not get it done or he may wait until the last minute and, and, and he had to write a manuscript for a book. It wasn't going to be a quick thing. So Peter was thinking about how to get this done. And he's a very motivated person. But again, he suffers from ADHD. He has trouble, you know, locking himself in a room and doing work. So he was thinking in his head, he goes, how can I get this done? How can I force myself to do this? So what he did was he booked himself a flight to Japan and I'm going to screw up the flight time, but I think it was like 14 hours, something like that. So what he did was he, he booked himself um, first class so he could actually work. You know, he could, you know, somewhat relax, have some space and write his manuscript. So we went 14 hours there. He arrived in Japan. He ate and then went right back on the plane. So he forced himself by, by definition of what the environment he put himself in. He forced himself to work 28 hours straight because what else are you going to do on a plane? I mean, yeah, you could turn on Netflix and you could keep yourself entertained. But, you know, he knew that if he put himself into that position, 20 something hours of flying, like, and he had to write a book, he could get it done that way. And the whole purpose of the story, and again, like we all know this to be true, is that we can pull off, you know, almost like Herculean things, but we've got to be in the right environment. And when we're not in the right environment, a lot of times things are a lot harder. And you've got to get yourself, surround yourself with the right people. You know, get rid of as many like drama things in your life, distractions, whatever. And Peter's case was obviously an extreme example of like, how do you block out the noise? Well, I just book a first class flight to Japan. Okay, well, um, you know, he was getting paid, <clears throat> I think he was getting paid a hundred grand just for the manuscript. So whatever that cost him to fly round trip, you know, both ways to Japan first class was a drop in the bucket. But it's just something to kind of think about, you know, how can you put yourself in that sort of environment? And different people in the group talked about, you know, how when they have to get some stuff done, a lot of times like they don't take their phone or they they set up the environment the right way to make sure that the tasks that they need to get done gets done. And um so again, just to kind of recap, again, you know, like I said in the beginning, my biggest takeaway, what I was blown away by is how many people raised 5, 10 million dollars just one year 
into doing this. And, um, and I posted publicly. I posted publicly. I have a goal to raise $20 million in 2023. And again, I really looked at it and I go, all right, that for me, that, that shouldn't be hard. But am I scared? Yes. I don't know if I can do it. I've never done it before. Um, you know, I I want to say I'm confident that I'm going to do it, but I'm really not. I'm not sure. But I can tell you this. I did feel a lot better coming back, being like, and I know this is going to sound really bad, but I don't mean it bad, is I felt like if that person can raise eight, I can raise 20. And again, the reason for that is because I've been doing this for 14 more years than them. I've already raised money before. I've got deals to put into. I've already got a little bit of an audience. So I'm like, you know, I, and I just felt good. So, um, you know, guys, if there's anything, if there's anybody that you know that's interested in getting a 15 to 20% rate of return, um, that's interested in investing in apartment buildings, that's got, you know, $50,000 of minimum capital, let me know. Help me out. Um, I'm definitely on a mission here to get to that 20 million. And for those of you who are on a mission to get money yourself, definitely join the inner circle. Reach out to me. Um, I'm confident that I can help you raise capital for your real estate deals. Um, you may not be able to raise 20 in year one because you may not have the structure in place, but I'm confident um, that I can help you guys get there for sure with whatever your real estate investing goals are. And again, last thing I want to leave off with is just, if you haven't registered for the two day event and please, like if you're flying in kudos to you, like I flew into Miami, you know, I spent a few thousand dollars to go to Miami. It was worth it. But man, if you're a local, don't sleep on coming to this. Don't sleep on the fact that we're in your backyard. Don't sleep on the fact that you can drive here from New York city, from New Jersey from Hartford, you know, I've gotten, I'm embarrassed to say I've been told by some people, Hey, I live, you know, South of Boston. It's too far. It's too far. And man, like that just, it burns me up because <clears throat> not because I'm so good. I am good. I'm a great trainer. I'm good at these events. We have great guest speakers. These events are worth it. But by telling me that you can't drive an hour, like you can't drive an hour to set up a seven-figure business, man, you know what I would do to, to set up a seven-figure business before I had a seven-figure business? You don't even want to know what I was willing to do. I would have done anything. So guys, if you're motivated, please um, register today, www.agentinvestorevent.com. It's free. It's free. All you got to do is make it there. If you're going to fly, you only need to book one night, one hotel night for a few hundred dollars flight all in. You're probably at this two day event for a grand. A lot of events like this charge a grand for the event. Some of them charge more, right? So it's an easy, inexpensive way to get out here. And um, I appreciate everybody who did humor me with some of the questions I asked today. I'm always curious. I'm always trying to get feedback on what you guys are, are thinking and need help with. Um, while we're here, last thing I want to wrap up on, do me a favor, type into the comment section if you guys are here. I'm always curious. Um, what should the topic for the next live stream be? Type into the comment section, what should the next um, live stream be about? What should the topic be about? Be very selfish right now. Let me know what you need help with. I'm willing to do these on any topics that are that are out there. Anything that I'm educated enough to talk on, I'll do. Type into the comment section what it is, guys, that you want me to do the next live stream on. And I know a bunch of you, I see a lot of, like at least half of the faces I see all the time. You guys are the one I'm talking to specifically. Be selfish. Let me know how I can help. Tap into the comment section, whatever topic that you want me to do. I don't care if one of you wants to do it. If, if you're somebody who comes, who blocks off their Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern every single week, and you're the only person who wants that topic, 
I want to do it because you're 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 my most loyal, you know, listener. So if you guys do have anything, type into the comment section what you want next week's live stream to be about. I hope you guys got value out of this. I think I did a pretty good job condensing three days worth of content into an hour, but I'm happy to continue to discuss anything else moving forward. And don't forget, book a call with the inner circle, www.agentinvestorinnercircle.com. You'll basically get a free consulting session just by booking. All right, guys, I'll be back again next week. And thank you. It feels good to be back in Boston. Thanks again for listening to the Agent Investor Podcast. And especially thank you for sharing the show with other agents and reviewing the show on iTunes. Every time you share the show and leave a review, you are potentially changing someone's life. To get free weekly education, strategies, and to connect with other agent investors across the country, join our free Facebook group at agentinvestor.com. Again, that's agentinvestor.com.